Today, we're continuing our series in Acts, and Ron Johnson, our lead pastor, is going to be walking through this series with us. But before he kind of jumps in, I want to invite him up, and we're just going to spend kind of a time and some prayer over just the, the hardships of, in our country and the events that have happened the last few weeks. Yep. Yeah. Thanks, Ron. Good morning, you guys. Uh, happy Memorial Day. Uh, yeah, it's been a hard week, has it not? I mean, I don't know about you, but I think everyone I've talked to, myself included, we feel kind of burdened over what we've seen in the news, Uvalde, Buffalo, um, shootings are on the rise, then we uh, continue to watch the news, read the news, the Ukraine's in our mind, plus it's Memorial Day weekend, so, um, you know, we're here in part, and we enjoy the freedoms that we have and the safety we have because people have laid their life down for us. So I um, just feel like it's appropriate for us to take 60 seconds or, or so and uh, just enjoy a moment of silence, and let's pray for uh, the victims of these shootings Let's pray for what's happening in the world, and let's thank God for uh, those who've gone before us and paid a very significant price for our freedom, okay? Father, we're a church that believes in extraordinary prayer and the power of prayer. And so we, we trust that in some way that we can't see, uh, you're hearing our prayers today. You're bringing comfort to victims and uh, hopefully in some way we can't see, bringing peace into the world. <clears throat> and then this Father, uh, Father, this morning as we get into the message, help us remember we, we have a message of peace. And that peace in this world always begins with people making peace with you. And so we commit our time to you this morning, in Jesus' name, amen, amen. Okay. Um, our, our vision as a church, if you're new to restoration, you picked a good day to come. Uh, our vision is to be a part of a, a global movement of everyday disciples, like people like you and me, making disciples for generations to come. We say global movement. Uh, locally, we have over 550 simple churches that are making disciples. If you're new to restoration, simple churches, they're kind of our jam. Uh, people go, what's the difference between a simple church and a small group? Um, small groups are, are great at getting people together, and they care for each other, and they go through some content, and they talk about it, and they kind of connect with each other. Uh, but they don't typically make disciples who make disciples. So uh, during COVID, we began to experiment with some different ways of doing you know, small group gatherings, and we've been learning from uh, other parts of the world about how to be a part of a disciple-making movement. And so now we have over 550 simple churches locally. And so we have first world simple churches and we have third world. We have a lot of people that are immigrants and refugees in our simple churches. And we're seeing some really, really cool stuff happen. And then uh, over in India, we're part of a simple church movement that's now at least 200 simple churches strong. Uh, we believe it's probably even bigger than that. Um, God willing, I'm going to India uh, in September with Jay Tinder Singh, one of our simple church catalysts. We'll see how healthy that move movement is and how it's growing. Uh, so that's, that's kind of our deal. And the, the reason we're so big on disciples making disciples is because we believe that the world would be a better place if everyone was becoming a little bit more like Jesus every single day. Amen, somebody? So yeah, we can legislate certain things and we, scientific advances and technological advances can help us, you know, with some of the world's problems. But every time we fix one problem, we got another one, right? And, and we believe that for the world to become a better place, a more peaceful place, it, it starts with the transformation of the human heart. And, and we believe that's why Jesus came, to transform hearts. And that's why we're so passionate about our vision. Now, it kind of terrifies us as well. Because making disciples requires we actually tell people about Jesus and what he's done to our lives. Anybody terrified about the idea of sharing your faith? Or at least you're very uncomfortable with that? Raise your hand. Okay, and the rest of you aren't being honest. Okay. All right, so most of us are pretty terrified. When Chris and I were started dating... Uh, we had a series of terrifying conversations, kind of define the relationship moment, moment kind of conversations where you go, okay, this is a go or no-go moment. We're either going to keep going with this relationship or we're, or we're not. You guys know what I'm talking about. Uh, so you, you have the money, the money conversation, and you pull out the spreadsheets, and you have the debt list, the liability list, all that kind of stuff. Go, okay, well, we passed that one. Then you have the sexual history one, up, oh, big gulp. Um, and, and then we had the kids conversation. I didn't want to have kids. I already had three. She hadn't had any, and she won. We have two more. Uh, anyway, so, and then, and then we had the KU versus Iowa State conversation about who we're going to root for during March Madness, right? And KU uh, is my team, and for good reasons, they won this year, right? And so that's still a tension point. We haven't resolved that one yet. But anyway, we, we, we had 
a series of like tense conversations, and it feels that way, doesn't it? When we, we share our faith with somebody or we just try to engage a spiritual conversation with somebody, there's a little moment like, ah, uh, how's this going to go, you know? I, I, I was coming down the hill from Mount Falcon the other day. I went into a 7-Eleven to get some Gatorade, and uh, I, I, I'm prompting my spirit. I should ask this guy across the counter, hey, how can I pray for you? And right before I asked him that question, there was a little moment of terror inside of me, like, oh, how's this going to go? Should I do this? And I did, and it went pretty well. Okay. Are, you, are you tracking with me? It's a little bit, a little bit of a moment of terror when you try to open your mouth and actually talk about Jesus. Um, Becky Pippert, in her book, uh, Out of the Salt Shaker, Into the World, said, Christians and non-Christians have one thing in common. They are both uptight about evangelism. So if, if you're here today and you're exploring faith, somebody drug you here, boyfriend, girlfriend, coworker, and you're kind of uptight about this topic, just know, just know, we are as well, right? So we're going to try to get past some of the reasons we don't share our faith, some of the reasons why we're afraid to open up. And I've been trying to figure this out, like, why is it, you know, we can get in arguments with people about the Broncos versus the Seahawks, but when it comes to actually telling people about Jesus, we, we, we get gagged. Like we're so afraid. And honestly, I don't have a good answer. Like maybe we don't, we don't want to be pigeonholed as being like a certain kind of person, a certain, uh, with a certain political alliance or fundamentalist type Christians with their Bible beating Bibles, you know, hitting people on top of the head. I, I don't think those are the main reasons. So I think, I honestly think it's the enemy. I, I think the events that have taken place this last week and we're seeing the news all the time, I, I believe it's demonically inspired. There is a real devil, there is real evil, and I believe the enemy wants us to shut up and not tell people about the hope of the world, which is Jesus Christ. Anybody agree with me today? So we got to overcome our reasons for not speaking up on behalf of Jesus, because we have the message that can bring the world the most peace, the most hope, and can change human hearts and make this world the kind of world that God wants it to be. So today, I'm, I'm going to give you seven reasons people don't share their faith. I'm going to give you some tools and concepts to help us overcome those reasons. And if you are a disciple of Jesus, a student, a, a practitioner of your faith, I'm going to encourage you to pick one, one application today, one thing you will do that will help you become more effective in sharing your faith and overcome your fear. Can we do that? Okay, tacit agreement. I'll take it. I'll take it. All right, uh, number one, we don't feel like it. We just don't feel like sharing our faith. We don't wake up in the morning going, whoo, I can't wait to go share my faith. We have to overcome that. Um, Acts 17, 16 through 34 will be our passage this morning. If you need a restoration, we're going through the book of Acts. Uh, verse 16 says, while Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. So a little bit of background. Last week we were in Acts 17, 1 through 15. Uh, Molly Soderstrom brought the message. If you were here, did she not do an awesome job? Can we put our hands together for Molly? So somebody said after the service on the porch, she's better than Beth Moore. Like 12 of you know who Beth Moore is. Anyway, she's a really big female teacher. Anyway, she did a great job. Listen to the message if you missed it. Uh, so in Molly's message, she talked about how Paul was uh, in Thessalonica and then he got ran out of town by some, some Jewish leaders who were jealous of his message and his popularity. Then he went to Bria, had a better response, but still a lot of tension there. And so he's kind of on the run a little bit, and he goes to Athens. And while he's in Athens, he's by himself. He's waiting for his, his like apostolic team, this church planting team, this supplement making team to catch up with him. And so while he's in Athens, he's walking around, and, and he noticed that the city was full of idols. So if you could go back in time 2,000 years ago, and you could walk through like the marketplace of Athens, you would see all these these statues of ancestral gods. And then like the more famous gods, you know, Paphrodite and Apollos and Zeus. And they were just everywhere. You could buy these things and people would worship them. Um, there's a place we'll see in a few moments called the Areopagus where they had all these gods and stuff. And so the city was full of idols and, and this distressed him. So I, I've been trying to figure out what's a great definition of what an idol is. And our worship leader, uh, Kyle, gave me a great definition. An idol is anything that replaces our need for God. An idol is anything that replaces our need for God. So a couple possibilities. Um, so my wife and I like to drink a little glass of wine before we go to dinner or go to bed at night, which I think is a bad habit, actually. So it's not good for your sleep, but we do it anyway. Nothing wrong with a glass of wine, right? The, the Bible says in Psalm 104, God's given us wine for gladness of heart. Amen, somebody? All right. One glass, okay. Two glasses, eh, maybe okay. Three, four, five, one bottle, two bottle. Now we got a problem. Right? So we, we drink because, you know, maybe at a certain point we're looking for some peace. We're looking for some rest. Maybe we're looking, our, our life feels numb and joyless, and so we drink more than we should. 
So at that, that moment when we cross that line, we just replace God as the source of our ultimate peace and rest and joy. Are you following me? Okay. Or our bodies. If you're new to Denver, uh, it, it's kind of a scary place to live because everyone looks like they belong in the Olympics. And um, when we go prayer walking over in Wash Park, we're praying for people. We actually pray a lot for body image issues because a lot of body image issues here in, in our city. And, you know, nothing wrong with taking care of your body, right? Nothing wrong with eating clean and working out. Our bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit. We should take care of our bodies and be good stewards. But at a certain point, if our body becomes our sense of self, the sense of our identity, if we become our bodies, like that's how we decide if we're valuable or beautiful or not, then we got a problem. Our bodies just replace God as the source of our identity because God alone can tell us who we are, why we're here, who we really are. God's love alone can define us. He alone can give us the security and significance that we need. Okay? Are you following me? An idol is anything that replaces our, our need for God. Uh, John Calvin said we are idol-making factories. As human beings, we are incredibly gifted at finding ways of not needing God and creating idols that, that act like God but never satisfy us the way God does. In Jonah chapter 2, verse 8, it says, those who cling to worthless idols forfeit the grace that could be theirs. Idols always take more than they give. So if you ever had a friend that you, you know has an idol, maybe you didn't call it that, but they're, they're going down a path and you know it's not going to end well. As you play the movie forward, you go, this is not going to end well. So we got a lot of Brooke Young adults here right now. You, you, you got a friend maybe and she's dating a boyfriend, like this is not going to end well. She's not coming to church as much. She stopped going to simple church. She's not reading her Bible anymore. She's, she's moving away from God. This is not going to end well because this boyfriend has replaced God. Okay? Or, or maybe you have a friend who... Uh, like aspires to be the next Elon Musk, and, and they're working 90, 100, 100 plus hour work weeks, and it's starting to have a detrimental effect on their family and on their faith and on their health. And you go, they've, they've made their business an idol. Are you following me? Okay. The way we overcome the fact we don't feel like sharing our faith is we let ourselves get stressed out about the idols in our lives and the idols in other people's lives that will always fail them. Do you have any friends right now, any coworkers, any members of your family, and, and they're far from God, and they're chasing after an idol that you know is going to be destructive in their lives? Okay, so a little disclosure here. I have only five kids, only five. And, and if you have multiple kids, you know how this goes. One of your kids will humble you. You always have one that humbles you. And for me, it's, it's one of my daughters, my adult daughters. And uh, she used to be a daddy's girl, and um, in recent years, we've had some turbulence, right? And um, I follow her on Instagram, and uh, it stresses me out because I know she's chasing all kinds of things that will not satisfy her, and it breaks my heart. And so I pray, I pray almost daily, God, please help her realize her idols are failing her, and they're going to keep failing her. I keep seeing her want to fill something in her heart, and she chases it, and for a moment it feels good, and then... The next moment after she chases that thing and gets it, it she's empty again. Okay. I know the only thing that can fill her heart is the love of God. Okay. So the way we get over our feelings about not sharing our faith is with compassion. We feel compassion towards our friends. We pray that God would give us compassion for our friends because their idols are failing them. All right, number two. Um, we don't know who to share with. Look around like, who do I share my faith with? Acts 17, 17 says, So he reasoned in the synagogue with both Jews and God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace day by day with those who happened to be there. So Paul had this modus operandi. He would, he would go into a, a city, and, and he would go to the synagogue if there was one there. If he didn't find a synagogue, he'd go wherever there were some Jewish people. And so he'd go into the synagogue, and what would happen is they'd have a service, they'd have some readings in the scripture, and the, the rabbi would teach a little bit. And they'd invite other people to get up and, and talk and do what they call midrash, which is like debating over the scriptures, and it was kind of fun. So he always got asked to speak a little bit because he was like, a, you know, a Pharisee coming through town. And, and he went to the synagogues for two reasons. One, he was looking for Jewish people who were open to the message of Jesus because they'd been taught their whole lives, there's a Messiah coming. All these promises in the Old Testament. And so Paul would say, you know that Messiah you've been waiting for? He has come. And his name is Jesus Christ. And he's the Savior of the world. And he died for us on the cross. And he rose from the dead. And he would explain the gospel. And some Jewish people would usually come to faith. 
But his primary target was not his own Jewish brothers and sisters. His primary target was usually God-fearing Greeks. It's mentioned in this verse. God-fearing Greek would be somebody who didn't grow up Jewish, but they were looking for God. Maybe they realized their other gods were failing them. And they were looking for a deeper connection to God. And they were looking to have their human needs met and they couldn't find it in their gods. And so they'd go to, the, they'd go to synagogues and learn about Judaism. And often those would be the people who were most open to the message of Jesus. And after they came to faith, then they'd go in the marketplace and they'd meet all their, you know, Gentile friends and share the gospel. And then people would become disciples and they'd gather in what we call simple churches and the movement would, would begin and would continue to grow. So in my simple church, uh, I, I got a friend on the front row, Todd Ropkin. Uh, he talks about green bananas and ripe bananas. I think we got that idea from you. And, and so we, we have a prayer list. And at the end of our simple church, we, we look ahead. We look back, look up, look ahead. We look ahead, and every week we talk about who can we share our faith with, how can we start other simple churches out of our simple church, because we're a spiritual family, and we want to invite other people to be in spiritual families. And so we've been talking about, well, you know, on our prayer list, as we pray for Christians and not Christians, that, that usually there's somebody on the list that's a ripe banana. They're, they're open. They're open to the message of Jesus. How do you know if a person might be open to, to the message of the gospel. A few ideas on that. Um, often they are in transition. Okay, they just moved here, which is a fairly popular thing for people to do. They're moving to Denver, and we, we kind of like you. We kind of don't, but you're, it's okay. We'll welcome you, even though you're, uh, you're, you're causing a lot of problems with the housing prices and gas and everything else. But yeah, we, 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 we accept you. We accept you in Jesus' name. So, because <clears throat> we, we're told we have to. Um, so welcome to Denver. And uh, so but people in transition, like moving here, they're kind of displaced, they're kind of disoriented, they're trying to figure things out. But they tend to be more open than people who've been here for a while, sometimes. Um, people who've just graduated, people who just got married, people who just got divorced, people who just had a baby. When we're in transition, we tend to be open. There's like the liminal space between us and God tends to get thinner, and, and we, we find a craving inside of us for security, for peace, for help, for higher power. Um, anxiety. Man, the world's full of anxious people. People who are anxious typically are very open to hearing about the peace that Jesus can offer them. And then finally, people who are addicted. Okay? Many of you know, have a story. You, you were addicted to something, and you came to this place where you felt helpless, and you needed a higher power. And, and then you're trying to figure out, who is that higher power? And at that, that point in a person's journey, they tend to be open to Jesus. So when, when you're praying, and I would recommend, if you, one of your applications today would be, if you're not praying for Christians and non-Christians, you don't have a list, make a list and then keep asking God as you're praying for people, God, who's open? Who's open? And there's all kinds of prayers we pray that we don't know if God's going to say, yes, here's an answer. I, I can guarantee you, if you pray that, that God would help you see people who are ripe and open and who, who are ready to hear the message of Jesus, he will say yes. He will eventually give you somebody. Okay? So if you don't know who to share with, ask God, start praying and, and look for people who are, who are open. Uh, number three. We are afraid of questions we can't answer. We're afraid of questions we can't answer. You may feel that? Like, I don't want to open my mouth because they might ask me something. I'm not going to have an answer for it. Um, Acts 17, 18 through 21. A group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to debate with Paul. Uh, some of them asked, what is this babbler trying to say? Others remarked, he seems to be advocating foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. Then they took him and brought him to a meeting of the Areopagus, where they said to him, may we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting. You are bringing some strange ideas to our ears, and we would like to know what they mean. Verse 21, all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there spent their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. I think Luke, as he wrote this, had a little tongue-in-cheek moment there. Okay, so he's in Athens, and the Athenians were, were known for two different philosophies, they were famous for these two philosophies. One was that of Epicureanism. Uh, if you've ever heard the phrase, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow you die, that was their phrase. Okay? They, they were sensualist. They believed the good life was defined as getting as much pleasure as you possibly can out of this life. Then um, almost their opposites, you had the, the Stoics. And, and the Stoics believed that each person has a divine spark within them. So as followers of Jesus, we believe we bear the image of God. Every person is infinitely valuable because they bear the image of God. But that doesn't mean we believe we are God. What we believe when you follow Jesus, the spirit of God goes inside of you, but you're not God. God's just within you, having communion with you. They actually believe that every person was a piece of God. And they believe that reason is the way to find the good life. Back to Genesis chapter 3, the serpent is, 
is tempting Adam and Eve. And what's he say? He said, God doesn't want you to have the knowledge of good and evil, which you'll have if you eat this fruit. Okay. So we've always been tempted as human beings to supplant the need for God in our lives with knowledge. And that was the error of the Stoics. Um, by the way, Stoicism is really popular right now. Marcus Aurelius' teachings, and there's some good stuff there. But here's my, pro- my, my uh, challenge for you. If you're into Stoicism, it will lead you away from God ultimately and towards yourself. So beware of that danger. Okay. Uh, Socrates was from Athens. Plato, Aristotle, democracy was born in Athens. A lot of the ideas and the, the Western world view came out of Athens. And so we benefited a lot from their, their wisdom and their intellect. But at the same time, there's a high level of intellectual arrogance. So they invite Paul to the area of Pagus. I mean, it was later called by the Romans Mars Hill. And, and they ask him to explain these strange ideas they've never heard about before. And, and so he begins to reason with them regarding the nature of his faith. And he does a brilliant job. So let me ask you this question. Do you know the reasons for why you believe what you believe? Can you articulate why you believe what you believe? Because 1 Peter 3.15 says, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. The scriptures encourage us to have charitable conversations, to learn how to, how to talk with people about what we believe with charity, not argue, you know, do it with emotional intelligence. But we're challenged to actually know why we believe what we believe. So in my experience, there are five questions that people ask again and again. There's actually ten, but there's, here's the top five that I always get asked. Um, one is, what is unique about Jesus? Why is he different than Buddha, Muhammad, Zoroaster, which, which Joseph Smith? Why is he different? And, and the sub-question there that we need to be able to articulate is, did the resurrection really happen? Because there's two things that make Jesus really, really unique. One is his message of grace. Jesus is the only one who says you can't save yourself, no matter how good you are, how religious you are. It's grace and grace alone. So you put your faith in Jesus, he gives you grace. That's what saves you. But the other thing that's really unique about Jesus is, uh, as best I can tell, no one has ever died and came back to talk about it in a resurrected body. He actually rose from the dead. His future body, his eternal body is what he came back in. And so do you have the ability to articulate why you believe the resurrection happened, why it's an historical fact for you. Okay, second question uh, gets asked a lot. Why would a good God allow people to suffer? Anybody get asked that question? Yeah, I mean, that is the, maybe the number one question people ask. How could God, if he's good, allow people to suffer down here so much? Uh, Corollary, why would a good God allow people to go to hell? Seems like cosmic overkill. Can we trust the Bible? Can we really trust it? It's like the telephone game where it's changed over time and you can't trust it. And then uh, number five, are science and the Bible compatible? So many people think they contradict. Okay. Do, you, do you have answers to these questions? You need help. Uh, great book by Tim Keller, uh, The Reason for God, New York Times bestselling book. He answers these questions, many more. Um, also a lot of great work out there by Lee Strobel, uh, Josh McDowell, and, and many others. Uh, but my point here is, you need to have reasons for why you believe what you believe. Not just for other people, but for you. Because someday, something's going to happen to you, if it hasn't already, if it's not happening right now, that's going to cause you to doubt your faith. And the opposite of faith is not doubt, it's sight. And so doubt can be your friend. And so if you're doubting right now, that's actually an opportunity for you to grow your faith. But when, when you suffer, you're going to need to re- have reasons for why you believe what you believe to keep you rooted and to keep you strong in your faith. Amen, somebody? Okay. And then secondarily, you want to do this for other people. Because you're not going to argue people into faith. Paul couldn't do that, and he was brilliant. No one gets argued into a relationship with God. But at the same time, we need to be able to remove intellectual barriers that are just getting in the way of people embracing the simple message of Jesus. Okay. Um, number four. We, we don't know how to start a conversation about Jesus. I hear this all the time. How we do these multiply training events. We talk about having faith conversations. And people go, I don't, I don't know how to get the conversation even started. I don't know how to do that. Let's learn from Paul. Acts 17, 22 through 23. Paul then stood up in the meeting of the area of Pagus and said, People of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, To an unknown God. So you're ignorant of the very thing you worship. And this is what I'm going to proclaim to you. You see what he's doing? So he's walking around the area of There's all these gods. And he, he sees this one altar. And there's no statue. There's no God on top of it. But it says, to an unknown God. 
So they're trying to cover their bases just in case they miss one, right? And he goes, you know what? I might know a few things about this unknown God, this God that you don't know about. And he begins to explain the message of Jesus Christ. What is he doing? He's starting where they are, and he's building a bridge, and he's taking them to what he wants them to understand, the message of Jesus Christ. Um, I, I've been uh, discipling a guy named Kevin, and uh, Kevin used to be an elder in our church, and then he uh, uh, moved down towards New Mexico, also known as Lone Tree. And uh, I've, I've not forgiven him for that. His business partner was here in the last service. I haven't forgiven him either. Everybody's moving to Lone Tree. Like, stop it. Uh, but we, we talk on Tuesday afternoons because he has four generations of disciples. He has people he's discipled, they've discipled other people, that have discipled other people. And we're trying to help these little tiny small groups become simple churches. And I'm going to do a training event for these guys this summer. And, and I, I feel like I'm discipling Kevin, but he's discipling me. So we were talking this last week uh, about like how to have conversations and how to get into a conversation about Jesus. And he gave me a tool that has been, I think, super helpful to me this week. He, he says, you know, in sales, we talk about feel, felt, and found. Any salespeople know about feel, felt, and found? Come on, Matt. Any others? Okay. Every time we do a multiplied training, some of the salespeople go, oh, that's feel, felt, found. Okay, so I'm going I'm to give you a little tool here that I'm kind of excited about right now. And, and, and some of you have always thought I had like multiple personality disorder, and I'm going to give you evidence that I do. So <clears throat> you're right, you're right. So over here is, is Ron, the non-disciple, not following Jesus, not a Christian, uh, doesn't know maybe a whole lot about Jesus. And over here is Ron, the, the disciple, okay? And we're having a conversation, we're hanging out. And, and Ron, the, the non-disciple, says, man, I've been really stressed out lately about what's going on in our world, uh, the war in Ukraine, you know, inflation, the prices of gas. I just bought an SUV. It's just a gas-sucking beast. True story. Um, you know, it's, it's hurt me, you know. And then uh, over here, Ron, the, the disciple is going, man, that sounds kind of tough. You know, I, I've been feeling the same things. I've felt the same things. And then Ron, the... Uh, and Ron's disciple is like, well, how are you managing it? And then Ron, the disciple says, well, you know what? I pray. Like recently, I'll be watching the news where I'll start to feel my chest get kind of tight, and I'll just stop, and I'll just breathe, and I'll take a few breaths, and then I'll pray. And I'll just tell God, like, what I'm feeling and how I'm feeling anxious right now. And there's this verse in the Bible that says, cast your anxiety on him. Because he cares for you. And when I tell him why I'm stressed and what's stressing me out, I actually feel this peace begin to come over me. And it's just like what the Bible says. It's like a peace that doesn't make any sense. It transcends understanding. And then Ron, the non-disciple, says, wow, tell me about Jesus because I want to follow Jesus right now. And if you just say a prayer and show me the gospel, I'm in. Which doesn't hardly ever happen. <laughs> okay. But do you see what, what I just did? I'm just being a human being, right? I'm just telling somebody how Jesus is, is changing my life, and I'm beginning with feelings. Because let's be honest, we're way more emotional as human beings than we are rational. It's our feelings that lead us to Jesus. Right? So that's a tool you might put in your little quiver, feel, felt, and found. Uh, D.T. Niles, who was a missionary, said, sharing Jesus is just one beggar telling another beggar where to find bread. Isn't that good? We, we just have found some bread. We call it the bread of life. And we're just trying to share with other people what Jesus is doing in our lives. Which brings us to the fifth reason uh, we don't share our faith, and that is we don't want to be a salesperson. We don't want to peddle Jesus. We feel kind of weird, kind of dirty because we're being a salesperson. Not that if you're a salesperson, you're a dirty person, right? But it feels that way when you're talking about Jesus. So, yeah, I've got to watch my jokes about attorneys and salespeople. Okay. Um, Acts 17, 24 through 28. Uh, the God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth. And does not live in temples built by human hands. And he's not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man, he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he's not far from any one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. So what, what's Paul doing here? As he's moving towards sharing the gospel with these people at this area of pockets, all these intellectual elites and some political leaders, he's starting with the fact that all of us as human beings, we have these very human needs, these questions that our heart aches to have answers to. Like, why are we here? Right? 
How do, how do, we, how do we have peace? What is the good life? Here's some questions um, that all of us ask to know who we are. We all want to know who we are. Uh, we all want to know why we're here. What's our purpose? Why do we, what are we supposed to do with our one, our one life? Um, to know what is the good life. I mean, the culture has all kind of definitions of like what the good life is. What really is the good life? How do we live our best life? How do we maximize our one life? Um, to know where we're going to go when we die. I was at a memorial uh, two weeks ago. A good friend of mine in the Springs died. And man, you go to a funeral, everyone's asking that question. Like, what's going to happen to me? What's happening to them right now? And then finally, to, uh, to feel like we belong. We all have a longing for belonging. We, we all want to be in like relationship with people who love us, who, who cherish us. That's why we try to build families. That's why as a church we start spiritual families where we have like spiritual connection with brothers and sisters who love us. And, and what we believe as followers of Christ is that the gospel of Jesus meets all of those needs. Following Jesus is not just about going to heaven when you die. It's about having the deepest needs of your heart met right now. Do I have a testimony in the room? Amen, somebody? Okay, good. So just be a human. You don't have to be a salesperson. Just be one human talking to another person, another human, about where to find the bread of life. Uh, I got a friend in the room right now. His name is Steve Cummick. I think we have pictures of Steve. Have you guys met Steve yet? Come on. Put your hands together for Steve. He just got baptized two weeks ago. Uh, he, uh, he's a big guy. He, he actually works for our kids upstairs. And so, parents, if you're worried about anything happening with your kids, just look at this guy. Come on. Like, I'm afraid to even take my kids up there because i got to talk to Steve. So he's everywhere. He's serving. Uh, really, really appreciate Steve and, and see the way you serve in our church. And it's been an honor to watch you grow since you've uh, become involved in our community. Um, Steve is a part of a multiply training led by Molly and Tim recently. And one of the things we do in our multiply training events is we go out and we, we pray for people. We pray just, you know, for people we like we see, but then we actually ask people, hey, is there a way I can pray for you? And uh, Steve got in a conversation over Wash Park with two women, and they were just like sharing, just one human being to another human being, and uh, he prayed for them, and then last week they came to restoration. Is that cool? Can we put our hands together for Steve. <laughs> so you don't have to be a salesperson. You have to be like good on your feet. You, you just need to be a human being. Just be honest with people. Be authentic with them. And, and help them know how Jesus is helping you. Um, number six, this is a big one, we don't know how to share the gospel. Most followers of Jesus I talk to, I go, do you have a way of sharing the gospel? They go, nope, don't know how to do that. Um, Acts 17, 29 through 31, Paul shares the gospel. He says, therefore, since we are God's offspring, uh, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by human design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He's given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. So you see what he's doing? He's going from their unknown God. He's saying, hey, it was okay in the past to be ignorant about that unknown God. But I'm telling you who he is. I'm telling you, he's the one who created everything. He is the one true God. All these other gods, not really even gods. And he invites them to repent, which means to turn, to have a metanoia, a change of mind. And to follow Jesus, the one who rose from the dead. Paul is sharing the gospel here. Do you have a way of sharing the gospel? Like if that moment came at Thanksgiving dinner or with a coworker who's struggling or with a friend who's addicted to something or a friend who's thinking about committing suicide, do you have a way in those moments of sharing the message of Jesus Christ with them so they can receive Jesus? And I don't care what the way is. It doesn't really matter. I don't care if you use like... Romans 6.23 in the bridge. I don't care if you use Roman road, four laws, do versus done. I don't care what you do, but do you have a way? Are you going to be ready when that moment comes? So as you came in, uh, we've got this little, little sticker here, dangerous little stickers. It's just one way to do it. So it's, we call this the three circles. Go ahead and pull those out. Um, they're designed to put on your phone. I've got one on my phone. We got the big one for people who can't see. We got a bigger one. For people over 50 like me and they can't see, they got the little tiny one for the little small phones, you know, that everyone under 40 uses. Uh, you, know, you don't have to do this, okay? If you don't want to do this, just leave it there on your, on your seat. But uh, a lot of us are putting these on our phone so that it's like right there. 
And when there's an opportunity to show the, the good news of Christ with somebody, we got a tool right there, okay? So let me walk you through this. Um, this is kind of a review. I did this on Easter weekend. Uh, we got the three circles, okay? So uh, we, we've had this feel, felt, found conversation, and now we're talking about whatever. It's anxiety. My, my friend's stressed out. And so we talk about, hey, you know, the world is full of brokenness, and that's what creates stress. You know, I could, you know, bring addiction to this or broken relationships. We start with brokenness because everyone you talk to will agree with you the world is a broken place, right? So you might ask them, what are some ways the world is broken? And they'll say inflation, war, cancel culture, racism, uh, disease, uh, Dallas Cowboy fans, whatever, okay? They're going to they're gonna, they're gonna, they're gonna chime in right here. And then well, let's talk about some ways we try to fix the brokenness in this world. And you ask them, like, how are we fixing this thing? And they'll say, well, you know, we try to legislate, uh, science and technology, self-help, whatever. Then you ask, well, how's it, how's it working? And they're going to say, well, not that great. So it's like whack-a-mole, right? In our personal lives and then globally, we fix one problem, we got another problem. Okay, world's broken. And then, and then you go to the, the first circle and you go, this is not the world God created. This is not how God made the world to be. God, God designed a world where it's filled with love, where, where people get like, Moment by moment, nourishment from God. God just, we're in communion with God and God pours his love into us. And it's just the natural thing for us to do is, is to love other people. And if we loved well, we wouldn't even need laws, right? The, the brokenness in this world is, comes from the fact we don't love each other. We often hate each other. And, and the Bible calls that sin. We've moved away from God and we replace God by playing God ourselves. And that's why the world is so broken. So you, you kind of get him in the bad news here. And then uh, you go to here, this, this third circle, and you go, but this is where Jesus came in. Like he literally came into the world to show us what God is like, to help us understand at the most fundamental level why the world is so broken, but also how through him we can fix the world and we can fix a relationship with God. And so Jesus went to the cross and he died there. And he died for me and he died for you. And the reason he died is because sin, walking away from God and bringing brokenness in this world, uh, it deserves death. Sin always brings death. Emotional, relational, environmental, and ultimately physical death are all the result of sin. And so Jesus went to the cross and died for us so that we have the hope that at the end of this life, there's more life to come. And that's why he rose from the dead, to give us the hope that one day we will all rise and he will restore all things. And so now if we'll simply turn from our brokenness and our sin and we'll pray and we'll receive Jesus as our Savior and our King, little crown here, our King, and we follow him as disciples. It's not enough to believe. It's not enough to be a Christian, a cultural Christian. You have to be a disciple. You have to follow Jesus. And moment by moment, intimacy. As you get in the word, he speaks to you. You obey him. You surrender to him. You trust he has a better way. As we do that, he begins to restore us. We, we become the kind of people who are more and more capable of bringing God's love into the world. Right? That's the three circles. Can you guys do that? Three of you said yes, the rest said no. Can't do that. Okay, let me, here's what I want to encourage you to do. If you want to use that little sticker, uh, put it on your phone and practice it five times. You can watch this message again on YouTube. You can go on YouTube. If you look up three circles, there's all kinds of people out there telling you how to do this. Uh, even better, come to our multiply training events this summer. We've got a number of them coming up. Uh, we've got one that weekend, that weekend, that week. We've got eight weeks coming up there. Um, I've got a couple for pastors coming up, but we're on a regular basis. We're training people. We'll practice the three circles. We'll train you. But you don't have to wait for that. Just go home and practice five times, and you'll have this down. Trust me. It's simple. It's that simple. But if you don't use this method, you know, find a method that works for you. It doesn't matter what the method is, but have a way of sharing the gospel so that when the moment comes, you are ready. Okay. Number seven. Number seven. Last one. Um, we feel too much pressure. We feel too much pressure. It feels like a burden to share our faith. Like it's all on us. Acts 17, 32 through 34. When they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered, but others said, we want to hear you again on this subject. At that, Paul left the council. Some of the people became followers of Paul and believed. Among them was Dionysius, a member of the Areopagus, also a woman named Damaris, and a number of others. So Paul has just finished his little speech here in front of these intellectual elite, political leaders, he has very little fruit. Two followers and maybe a handful of others begin to follow Jesus. Okay. Not a lot of effectiveness. In fact, almost every city Paul went to, he'd see a, a fair amount of fruit and they'd start churches. We have no historical record of Paul starting a church in Athens. Perhaps one of the few places he didn't plant a church because there was so little fruit. 
Do you think when he stood before these intellectual elite in the area of pockets, do you think he felt a little bit of pressure? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. What did he do with it? He did what he wants us to do, what God wants us to do. He trusted, he trusted the Holy Spirit. And we're going through the book of Acts for a reason. We're trying to learn how to be disciples, to make disciples. But we're also going through the book of Acts because the book of Acts is the acts of the Holy Spirit through everyday followers of Jesus like us who are disciples who made disciples. So when you feel pressure, remind yourself in that moment, it's not about me. It's not about being good on my feet. The pressure's off. It's the Holy Spirit. I have never persuaded anybody to follow Jesus. The Holy Spirit always does the work. And so if you trust in him, you'll have peace. Amen? Somebody? Okay. And so you're saying, well, you know, uh, that's all great, Ron, but I'm a brand new believer. I'm still kind of anxious about this topic. Ah, this, this scares me. Let's take some baby steps. Maybe you're here today and you're a follower of Jesus and you've just begun and you're like, this is like PhD, 401 kind of stuff. What can you do? I would just say invite your friends. So we do three things as a church. We keep it really simple around here if you're new. We do happy hours. <laughs> We're good at that. We do church services like this one, worship services, and we do simple church, okay? The reason we do happy hours is because a lot of our friends would never come to a church service. They won't come to your simple church, but they will go to a happy hour. So bring them, bring them. Also, we do these church services, and while we're focused on equipping each other to you know, go out and do ministry and, and, and you know, worship God, uh, we are seeker-friendly. So bring your friends. We had a person who came to the last service, and she became a follower of Jesus today. Is that good news? You can put her hands together for that. Okay. And let me remind you, we have an 8 o'clock service beginning next week, and so if this vibe isn't the vibe for your friends, check out the vibe over there. It's light, it's bright, it's acoustic. It's a short service. Maybe they get up early. Uh, come join us next week. It's going to be a lot of fun to have that 8, in, 8 o'clock service available to us. All right. Uh, I want to end with a story. Uh, my, my wife and I, uh, we went to Mexico back in February, and uh, we were trying to thaw out from the winter cold, you know, like you do. And uh, we're on the plane, and somehow I got stuck on the window seat, which I hate the window seat, but I'm like, whatever. And she's in the middle, and there's this guy on the aisle seat, and he's from Lakewood, and his wife was like across the aisle. And so we start having a conversation, and I learned he's in a startup, and they're going to go public. And uh, I learned that he used to create like zombie apocalypse video games. Like, that's kind of cool. And, and then I find out that he grew up in a, a home. He finds out I'm a pastor. He goes, I grew up in a home where we were materialists. We didn't, you know, we're scientific. We didn't ever believe in God. And so we're talking about all kinds of stuff. And he brought up some of those questions that people ask about science and the Bible. And uh, we're kind of having a good time talking about this stuff. And, um, and then he told me, he goes, you know, I don't believe in a soul. I don't believe in a mind. We're, we're just a brain. And so it's like a computer with flesh on it. He goes, yeah, yeah, like that. And I said, so what's love? And he said, love is, is just a chemical reaction between two human beings. And then I was kind of feeling a little ornery. So I said, okay, so tonight when you finish seeing your friends at this destination wedding and you, you go to a hotel room and you're feeling kind of romantic towards your wife, um, why don't you just tell her, hey, honey, I'm having a really awesome chemical reaction right now. You know? Instead of saying, I love you. And um, she was across the uh, aisle listening to all this. And he was smiling on his face, but in his heart he was flipping me off. Okay? <laughs> I'm pretty sure. That's, you could tell, like, okay, that, that messed with me. Uh, that guy did not come to faith that day. He did not receive Jesus Christ. Uh, we didn't play just as I am and do an altar call. None of that happened. I, I was not fruitful. I was like Paul in Athens. No fruit, no fruit. But here's what I felt in that moment. I felt God's pleasure. I felt God's pleasure. See, we, we share a faith because, yes, if people became more like Jesus every single day, the world, world would be a better place. Because we believe that we have the hope of the world in this message of Jesus Christ. But honestly, I, I share my faith because it makes me feel closer to God. I, I walk away from conversations like that and I go, man, I am so blessed. Like, I really believe this stuff. I've experienced it. The grace of God, the forgiveness of God. That he's given me this incredible purpose. In those moments when I share my faith, I feel the presence and the pleasure of God. And that's what I want for every single one of us. So, friends... If you're a disciple of Jesus, I want you to do this right now. We're going to have a moment of prayer. We're going to ask God to speak to us. I'm going to ask God what one thing you could do this week to overcome your reservations of sharing your faith, one thing that would help you become more effective in sharing your faith. What, what would that be? 
Is it, you know, rethinking about what it means? You're not a salesperson, you're just a human being. One beggar telling another beggar where to find bread. Is it, is it learning how to like start conversations with feel, felt, and found? Is it learning how to share the gospel? Is it getting some answers to some questions? What do you need to do this week that would help you overcome your fear and become more faithful and fruitful in sharing your faith? Let's take a moment, let's bow our heads, let's pray. Let's remember, church family, that uh, we want to be doers of the word, not just hearers. We grow through doing. And so ask the Holy Spirit to tell you what he would like for you to do as a result of what he said to you today. And then while the disciples in the room are praying, I want to speak to those of you who are not yet following Jesus. And maybe you're where that woman was in the first service. You can't think of a good reason not to follow him today. Why not begin to follow him today? Why not receive the gift he's offering you right now? How do you do that? You pray. You simply say, Jesus, uh, right now, I receive your gift of grace and love and forgiveness. And I thank you for dying for me on the cross to pay off my sin debt. And so right now, I give you my life for yours. And I ask you to fill me with your spirit. And I ask you to help me become more and more like you. If that is your prayer, say yes in your heart right now. Just say yes. And I would encourage you to get baptized as soon as possible. We actually have baptisms right after the service. You can get baptized today. But if not, let us know your connection card. You'd like to get baptized. We'll reach out to you. And uh, we'll, we'll make it really special as soon as possible. Father, we thank you uh, for your word. Uh, we thank you for the honor you've given us to be your ambassadors. To, to share the message of Jesus Christ, the, the, the most hopeful message the world has ever heard. We get to do that. And we get to see lives transformed before our very eyes like we see week after week here at Restoration. And so we thank you. We ask you to embolden us, to equip us, to help us take risk on behalf of others. And all of this for your pleasure and for your glory, Jesus Christ. In whose name we pray.